Today, I want to just continue on. We've been talking about the limitless possibilities. And uh, we had different parts of that. There was three truths, just to kind of recap, that God has made us kingdom of priests, and our responsibility is to rule the world of God for God by our prayers and by our lives. And to be effective, our prayers must be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit and the Word of God, the Bible, always works together. And the power of the Holy Spirit only works through our prayers as they're in line with God's Word. Second Chronicles 7.14, as many of you know, is, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their lands. And there was seven things in that verse. And the first three things God says he will do. God says that he will hear from heaven. God says that he will forgive our sins. And God says he will heal our land. So God says if we meet his conditions and we do our part, then he will do his part. God gives us the possibility that our land can be healed. But there's parts that we must do. And I shared before that there's prayer individually and there's prayer corporately. And when corporately we can come together as a nation, I believe we can move and God can heal our land. But it's so hard because as I shared before, we're just so divided. The church is divided. And it seems like we can't even get ourselves together. But the four requirements for God to hear our prayer uh, starts off with just humility. That uh, we've got to humble ourselves before God. And one way I talked about that is through the way that God provided was through fasting. It allows ourselves to humble ourselves. The next step was to pray out of humility, pray out of brokenness, pray out of a humble dependence upon God, out of a a brokenness, an acknowledgement that we need God desperately. And so you put yourself into a desperate place. You willingly put yourself, your soul and your spirit in a desperate place so that God can, you can hear God. And God says he'll come to us. When I talk about desperately, it really means that that we come to an understanding that without God's help, there is no other help. There's no thing available. And, And it's so hard in our country to see that. You see God moving in tremendous miracles overseas. Why? It's because there is, they're totally dependent upon God. We're dependent. We don't need to be dependent on God. We have welfare and we have all these provisions in America. We live in a rich country. We can, we can get by without God. But when you see places where there is nothing except God, uh, in, when we've gone to Ghana on the mission trip and gone with Don Sauter there at, uh, at uh, Christian Hope, he has a tattoo on his arm that is the African symbol of accept God. And uh, because their understanding is without God, except God, there's nothing. You, you, they're totally dependent on that. Totally dependent. Except God, forget it. You know, we just can't live. And so we need to get ourselves and move ourselves, humble ourselves to that place. Many times our prayer really comes out of arrogance and our prayers come out of self-reliance and self-sufficiency, pride. And I just believe that a lot of times when we, when we pray in that sense, I don't think it really moves the hand of God. My judgment, my call that I'm saying, and I'm just talking kind of general. But the next thing we need to do is to seek God with, with and seek his face. Hosea <clears throat> ten. 12 through 15, it was kind of saying the same thing as he says, sow righteousness for yourselves, Hosea 10, 12 through 15. Sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, 
and break up your unplowed ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. And then it says, but, here's the bad part, but you, I should say you, however, have planted wickedness. You have reaped evil. You have eaten the fruit of deception. And I would say, well, why is he saying that? And he answers it the next week. Next, next week. He says, because you've depended on your own strength and your many warriors. Isn't that America today? <laughs> We, we've depended upon our own strength. One time, we were, our country was vastly, I mean, you know, pretty much everyone went to church. Church was just part of our society. It was just part of our frame, part of our, that's what we did as a country. But we came so strong in our own, the Bible says, in our own leaves, and the wine casks that, that they used to make wine in, and they would, they would ferment it and put it in these wine barrels, and, and, and it would stand there, and then there would be a ring, you know, like a ring around it. They called that lees, and it would get strong because it was strong in its own strength, and they'd have to pour it into another container and clean the lees out. Sometimes we, even though it's good, we become strong in our own lees, and, and, and sometimes God has to just pour us out and kind of clean us out again. And it's not sometimes that we're doing every, anything wrong. We just come strong in our own flavor. America became so strong in our own flavor that all of a sudden we're not dependent upon God anymore. It says, 14, the, the roar of the battle will rise against your people so that your fortress will be devastated. Hmm. Sounds like it's happened here. 15, so what happened to you, Bethel, because of your wickedness is great. When that day dawns, the king of Israel will be completely destroyed. When that day dawns, America will be completely destroyed. I believe the only hope for America is really the church to come together and unite together because it was founded upon the principles of God. I believe this is what Second Chronicles is talking about, it's 714, that, that I believe the two kind of go together. What are we sowing into our, our lives, and what have we allowed God to come in, and that's why I talk about humbleness, is that he, he comes in and he needs to break up our fallow ground. Well, what do we do to break up our fallow ground? There, there needs to be areas of our life that we need to look at that maybe they're not cultivated yet. Well, what does cultivated mean? It means, I'm not a farmer. Our ag expert here can help us out here, uh, Harold. It, it means that it, it breaks up the ground. I remember when I was a kid, I had the great job that my dad would stick me in the garden. And, and uh, you know, my job all day through the summer was, it seemed like it was all summer, but was to take a spade shovel and turn the dirt over, you know, row by row. Back then, we didn't have rototillers. We had a spade shovel. And I was the son, so I got the spade shovel for the day. And uh, we spaded it over the garden. Why? Because it broke up the hard ground so that he could plant again. Could it be in your life that you're strong in your own flavor, your own Christian walk, and you need to have it cultivated so that God, again, can, can, can plant fresh seed into you? What are areas in your life that are not bringing fruit in your life? Areas where there's no really results or evidence that God is in control of your life. You be the judge of that. Look at your life. Judge it. You judge yourself. Is there fruit that God will look at you and say, man, look at that. If you represented a tree, look at the fruit that you're bearing in your life. What are areas of your life that you're not seeing the Holy Spirit work in your life? God says, break up your follow ground. Plow your field. Seek the Lord until he comes. And then let his righteousness reign in your life. You know, when you, when you do right, God blesses you. When, you. when you sow seeds of righteousness, God blesses you and it grows into righteousness. 
When you sow seeds of discord, what's going to grow? Discord in your life. What, what, what seeds do you plant in the ground that you're involved with in your life, in your workplace, in your family? I believe that's even as a church said, that God is using us to be seeds in our community. I believe our only hope as a nation that God will come and rain righteousness upon our land and that, that his seeds that he throws out, which is you and I, that, that we represent that. But if we've got hardened ground and we're all about ourselves and there's no, no good soil that God can really work in, then, then we're just dried up. The fourth requirement is that we turn from our wicked ways. Well, you might say, what, well, what do you mean wicked ways? I go to church, I say my prayers, I read my Bible, I pay my taxes. I, I do nobody any harm. What? Well, who's right here, you or God? Are you saying that you don't have any wicked ways? God says that that has brought a problem to our nation. Your wicked ways has brought a problem. Let's break it down. Even your wicked ways reflect upon our church because our church reflects God. And where you go, you're, you're bringing Southside Alliance Church with you. You're bringing the kingdom of God with you. You're bringing, you're bringing all that God represents. Here's two possible ways of wickedness. The Bible talks about sins of commission and, and sins of omission. Sins of commission are, are, are the biggest. Things you know that you shouldn't do and you do them anyway. Like if you're addicted to certain things. Lust, porn, alcohol, drugs. Whatever those things you know you shouldn't do. Those, those vices, those maybe, and then maybe it's just even uh, you, you've got anger problems and pride problems and other issues of your life that you cheat and steal and all those kind of things. Those are sins of commission. You know you shouldn't do them and you do them anyway. But then there's also sins of omission. Because a lot of us, when we accept the Lord, those things become strangely dim, and all of a sudden they're not forces in our life that they... When I first became a Christian, I thought, how in the heck am I ever going to stop swearing? You know, How am I going to stop doing this? How am I going to stop doing that? And as God became more in my life, and he started blessing me, those things became small. It wasn't me even trying to make changes, because God was in my life making those changes. I didn't even have to work at those things. But there's so, sins of omission. In James 4, 17, it talks about that. And it's a sin not to do the right thing when you can. Omission is not, not doing the right thing when you can. And I think we as a church and we as Christians do that so much. I do that so much. James 4, 17 says this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. Oh boy, I have a tough one with that. The sin of wickedness is not just what we're doing, it's, it's what we're not doing that God is concerned about. Let me give you one example of that. How about, and which is common among us Christians, unforgiveness. Remember the story of the owner and the master? We talked about talents earlier. One had 10,000 talents. He could not, well, this was a, an, an, another example of that than the story that you were given. But uh, he had 10,000 talents that he could not pay. And the master freed him of the whole debt. And he, when he ran out into the, and saw another fellow servant of his, he refused to forgive him for the allotment in which he owed him. And so even though he was forgiven a large amount, he went back out and he wasn't forgiven a small amount. And when that other servant complained to the master, the master summoned him and he said, you wicked slave, I forgave you the, all the debt because you asked me. And you did not show mercy on your fellow slave. I, I have given that, uh, the same mercy that I have given you. Then the slave was handed over uh, until he would pay back 
all that he owed. Jesus uses this parable, and he concludes the parable by saying this, what my heavenly Father shall do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. See, because God forgave you something so much larger than anything that can happen to you. Well, Pastor, I was abused as a child. I hate my father. All the sin, all the sin of the world was cast upon Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin for you and I. The price of the penalty that he paid on that cross was higher than any price you and I can pay. And so because we're forgiven, we extend that forgiveness to other people. Because God loved us, with that love we can love other people. Unforgiveness is wickedness. Could it be that it makes the Lord angry? Could it be that as that slave, the punishment was to be handed over to the torturer? Jesus warns us specifically, if we do not forgive our fellow believers, this is how God will deal with us. He will be angry with us. He will hand us over to the torturers, and we will not come out of it until we paid all our debt to God. Maybe it's so important that Jesus also put it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us as we, what? Forgive others. It can also mean that forgive us like we forgive others. Shouldn't it be? Forgive me, Father, like I forgive others. So if I have no forgiveness in my heart... then that's the attitude God should have for me. It's tough. And I'm not saying it's easy. But what happens that as you let go of that and you're saying, and God says, I will take revenge, and we say, God, I can't do this on my own, but I, I lay this to you and I give it to you. And I ask you to forgive those. I don't understand when, you know, when a parent uh, and their chi child is killed and then they're able to go to that person in prison and say, uh, I, I forgive you. You know, that, that's tremendous strength, isn't it? It's tremendous strength if you can forgive someone that's really, really, really hurts you deep. And I believe it's only the Holy Spirit that's within us that can get us to that place. I'll never forget Corey Ten Boom and Suzanne's father knew her personally because he worked for Billy Graham's Association and did the movie. And Corey Ten Boom was that gal who wrote The Hiding Place and uh, she's passed away now. Uh, and she was went around after uh, really the world sharing about her story, how they were tortured, and because they kept the Jews in their home, they were thrown into prison camp. Her and her sister was in the prison camp together. Um, she saw her sister raped, beat, and they were both beat and abused badly. And but then she uh, talked about the forgiveness of God, and and uh, she went around, and all of a sudden she was in one church. And one of the prison guards came up to her and, uh, and said, I heard you speak tonight about forgiveness, and I need to ask you forgiveness for what I did to you and your sister. And her first immediate reaction is she said she rose her hand to slap him. And at that moment, God changed her heart, and she gave a hug and kissed him on the cheek and said, I forgive you. It's only God, his Holy Spirit, that can sometimes do that work in our hearts because naturally it just can't happen when ugly things like that have happened to us. And many of you in here can have a story of what happened to you. I, I know. Um, and it's only God's Holy Spirit that when you get that healing and you have the power of that in you, that you can release it and give it to others. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6 says, He who believes that he is. It says, and it's without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Do you see, as we earnestly seek him, that's when things start happening that are miracles in our own life, as we see. But we've got to be earnestly doing a part on our part. See, there's an action on our part. We just can't come and, and take a pew space and, and think God's going to work our life. We have to actively, earnestly seek the Lord ourselves. It's not up to a Sunday school teacher. It's not up to your pastor. It's up to you. It's up to you. And there's rewards as we seek him. His righteousness, his love, his forgiveness. We do change from we were this way and now he's made us into a new creation. We've been born again. We're born out of that flesh. We're born into righteousness. And that old person, all kinds of things may happen to him, but that person was buried and he's gone and now I rise to newness of life. In Genesis 31.3, the, the Lord said to, unto Jacob, he says, it's time to go back. Maybe for some of you, it's time to go back. Well, what do I mean by that? And here it was, it was a time to return to the land of your fathers, of his fathers, to his kindred. And he said, the Lord said, I will be with you. Jacob hears the voice of God, and he, he knows his voice. He heard it before. Jacob needed to go back to the place that he first heard it. He needed to go back to the land of his fathers. Jacob was being called back to his appointed place where God said, I will be with you there. He's being called back to the place of God's presence, into a place where a covenant was fully established in his life. He wasn't called back just to visit. He was called back to live there. If you're redeemed by the blood of the Lord, the Lord is calling you back home to that place, not for a visit, but to come and, and to stay in that place that he's redeemed you. He's redeemed you by the blood of the Lamb. Maybe you've backslidden, you made some wrong choices, and this morning God is calling you back. Maybe you're hearing a whisper. Maybe you're hearing him shout in your spirit. And he's just saying, come, come, come. Come back to the redeemed. Would you say with me, I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Would you just say that? Let me hear it louder. Therefore, I shall return. Is it? Say it again. Therefore, I shall return. Would you stand with me and just bow your heads and hearts? Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell. and like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.